Yeah, thanks everybody um, for coming. This is the second week of the Apostolic Fathers. Um, the Apostolic Fathers are that group of Catholic bishops, priests, theologians who knew the apostles and learned the faith from the apostles. Um, you can generically call a lot of early Catholics the early church fathers, typically those theologians that wrote important works during the first five centuries of Christianity are called the early church fathers. Um, you can find all of their works, you can find a lot of books uh, published about them. Again, this week we're drawing mainly from the Father Willis book, which is an excellent text on the early church fathers. In particular, we're talking about a few of the apostolic fathers, those church fathers who knew the apostles, learned the faith from the apostles. So briefly, we'll recap what we did last week. Last week, we, we outlined the, the problem, we outlined the question for a lot of modern Christians, particularly those people who are not Catholic, who are Christian, who rely on their private interpretation or their corporate denominational interpretation of the Bible, which they're doing 2,000 years, a little less than 2,000 years after those scriptures were written, and they're doing their best. I think we can say that most people who are involved in this personal and private or corporate denominational wide interpretation of scriptures, they give it their best shot. But since there are between 40 and 50,000 separate Christian denominations in the United States alone, not many of which agree with each other on the proper interpretation of scripture, I think we as Catholics can kind of give a little knowing nod and smile and say, we see some problems there. We as Catholics know that the scriptures are but one part of divine revelation, with holy tradition being the other part, and we know that they act in concert together, that sacred tradition is a necessary part of divine revelation. This is why we have one Catholic church as opposed to 40 or 50,000 Catholic churches. So, we said last week it would be very, very handy for answering the question of what scriptural interpretation of difficult matters is correct if only some of these men who had known the apostles had learned the faith at the feet of the apostles and knew without a doubt what the proper understanding of these difficult principles were. It would be so great if these men had written this down. And they did. And we have these works of the early church fathers, even of the apostolic fathers. Last week we went over one particular apostolic father, I think the most dramatic of the apostolic fathers as far as his writing, St. Ignatius of Antioch. We went over where Antioch was, what the situation in Antioch was, where the Christian community there came from, and how it was Grand Central Station for the Apostles in the middle of the first century. How St. Ignatius definitely knew Peter and John and Paul and would have known their co cohorts, probably would have known other apostles, would have known St. Luke, would have known these people, and was ordained to the episcopate, was ordained to be Bishop of Antioch by probably Peter and or Paul. He was certainly selected by St. Peter to be the second successor to St. Peter as the Bishop of Antioch. And we said that if anyone is the horse's mouth for knowing what apostolic teaching was, it's St. Ignatius. And then in a very triumphalistic Catholic way, we went through many, many quotations of St. Ignatius and showed how they are definitely, obviously, Roman Catholic. We even brought out that St. Ignatius called the church Catholic, and we went over how his definition of Catholic involved the presence of the bishop, Christ in the Eucharist, and the people making up the complete or Catholic church. Now that's Catholic. So this week we're going to do another apostolic father. Now we're only hitting a few apostolic fathers. There are other authors, um, theologians in the apostolic times that we're not going to get to in this class. People like Papias, the author of The Shepherd of Hermas, we are going to do, however, tonight, St. Polycarp. And this is a painting of St. Polycarp suffering martyrdom. And as you can see, he is one of many, many early Christian bishops.
whose life ended in a violent way. We know that Ignatius, the first image we had last week, as well as the last one, was a typical icon of St. Ignatius, which was St. Ignatius being eaten by two lions in the Colosseum. So this week we start off with Polycarp and how he died, which was by fire. The fire didn't, in fact, kill him. It's an interesting story, and we'll talk about the details of the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. We're also going to talk about a student of St. Polycarp, because we only have one extant document written by St. Polycarp. Presumably, he wrote others, but we only have the one. And so this is the letter to the Philadelphians. And because we only have the one writing of St. Polycarp, which is fascinating and has a tremendous amount of information in it, we're also going to talk about how Polycarp transmitted the apostolic teaching on to the next generation and who that next generation was, in this case, St. Irenaeus. Now, we'll start with Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna, and if you remember last week, of the seven epistles of St. Ignatius that he wrote while he was being taken from Antioch to Rome to suffer martyrdom, one of these epistles was written to St. Polycarp, so they were obviously associates. If you're writing your last seven letters before you die and you write one of them to a particular bishop, you know this bishop well. So we have this connection first, Polycarp to St. Ignatius. We know that Polycarp lived, we know pretty certainly that he was born in either 69 or 70 AD. And we'll stop there for a second and we'll set him in history. He's born about 35 to 40 years after the resurrection. What does this mean? This means that he has the opportunity not only to know some of the apostles, but he also has the opportunity to know other people who saw and heard Jesus Christ. So this is what it means to be an apostolic father. We focused last week on St. Ignatius and his connection to the apostles, but one of the things that we'll hear about Polycarp, which was definitely true of Ignatius, is that they also knew average Christians, people who had heard Jesus Christ. This is how close their connection is. Part of that, the horse's mouth aspect of the apostolic fathers that we're trying to build here. He died in about 156 AD. Polycarp is the bridge between the first and second century of Christianity. He was martyred by the Roman authorities in one of these minor persecutions. Uh, some people think he was martyred under a more general persecution under Marcus Aurelius, but Marcus Aurelius didn't become emperor until 161 AD, and the dates don't quite match up. These persecutions when you read about the early church fathers and you read that they died in a persecution, people often try and pin that event to one of the general persecutions under one of the emperors. But I think that it's a more reasonable thing to say that Christians were very unpopular. They were unpopular with Romans. They were unpopular with Jews who lived in Roman society. They were unpopular with a lot of people. And they were apt to get thrown in jail and they were apt to be punished whether there was a general persecution on or not. So when you're reading about these people and you read that someone was martyred at a certain time or they suffered under the Romans at a certain time, you won't always find that corresponding to one of the well-known persecutions, and that doesn't always matter. Um, the persecution that Ignatius died in may have been limited to one person, Ignatius. That seems entirely reasonable given the historical milieu that he lived in. Um, in this case, it's possible that he died under Marcus Aurelius, but we think he probably died a little earlier than that. The student of St. John. Everyone that writes about Polycarp for the first four centuries after his death, everyone says, yes, he was a student of St. John and was likely ordained to the episcopate by him. And we'll talk about how likely that is. We're also going to be talking about his student, Irenaeus. Irenaeus is the next generation after Polycarp. Irenaeus, Irenaeus is born in Smyrna, where Polycarp was the bishop in 130 AD. So they overlap by about 25 to 30 years. So Irenaeus has Polycarp for his bishop and his teacher for his entire early life, knows him well, and writes extensively about him. Irenaeus, who eventually himself became a bishop of um, Lugdunum in Gaul, which is today the city of Lyon, France, 
he wrote an extremely important early work called Against Heresies in about 180 AD. Against Heresies, if you're going to read something from the early church, read Against Heresies. It takes a while to get through it. You're not going to read it in an hour and a half like the Epistles of Ignatius. You better set aside several evenings. Um, you can get it for free online. Newadvent.org has excellent translations of most of these works of the early church fathers. Um, it's great to read Against Heresies, um, and we'll talk a little bit about why it was written, different things like that. But this is Irenaeus drawing on the apostolic teaching which he got from his bishop and the other men that he knew and the other Christians that knew the apostles, and he writes a very long and detailed work that we're also going to talk about tonight. So, where are we this evening? So, last week, I don't have a pointer this week, I'll use a finger. Last week we were in Antioch, here in northern Syria. This week we're in the province of Asia. Not Asia meaning China and India. This is the Roman province of Asia, which is today western Turkey. Now, that area is very interesting to us because that was the area that St. John the Apostle apparently functioned as archbishop over in the second half of the first century. If you know your scriptures, then you know the book of Revelation, written by John, was written to the seven churches of Asia. And these are the seven churches of Asia. Uh, John lived, a very, lived to be an old man. All of the early church commenters that write about the Apostle John say that he lived a very long time. Um, Eusebius, the church historian, even says that some people started to think that John wasn't going to die, that maybe there was some supernatural mojo for the last apostle and he wasn't going to die because John lived to be so old. Now, somebody living to be 65 or 70 years old, that wouldn't have caused this commotion. John apparently lived to be 90 or over, and this caused everyone to think something was... But John eventually did die. But while he was alive, and from roughly 50 or 60 A.D. to roughly 90 or 100 A.D., John lived in Ephesus. You can see Ephesus there, very close to Smyrna. And John functioned as an overseer over all of these churches. The system that we have as Catholics, with bishops over a city or a metropolis, and with an archbishop functioning as an overseer over groups of churches and their bishops, this is apostolic. This goes back to the apostles. We can see this system at work in the life of St. John. Now, John wrote the book of Revelation to these churches. And it's interesting. If you read the book of Revelation, who's he writing to? Well, if you're reading a, a modern translation of this, it's often rendered as the angels of these churches, to the angel of the church at Thyatira, to the angel of the church at Smyrna. But that, that word... In Greek, angelos, it doesn't just mean angel, it means messenger. And so a more historically accurate rendering of who's being written to in the book of Revelation are the bishops of the seven churches of Asia, of Asia Minor, the messengers of these churches. Because it doesn't make much sense to write to angels. Angels already know what you're writing about. The bishops might need help because... John was writing the book of Revelation sometime during the 80s or early 90s during the persecution under the emperor Domitian. He was exiled, and exile was a very common punishment if you were convicted of atheism, which is what Christians were, disbelief in the Roman national gods. So John would have been convicted of atheism, and he was exiled. This is very common. Several of the early popes were exiled. John was exiled to this little island of Patmos, and that's where he was when he wrote the book of Revelation to these seven churches. And that would have been during the 80s or the early 90s. So one of the people, one of the messengers of these churches of Asia Minor that the book of Revelation was written to probably would have been Ignatius of Antioch. So this is where we are for this week. And... Most of the action this week is taking place in Smyrna, and you can see that it's just a hop and a skip and a jump. Those are the two adjacent good ports on the sea there from Ephesus, which was John's see as the apostolic archbishop of this area. So, Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, just down the road from John's see. We'll read about him first. This is his student, someone who knew him, Irenaeus, writing about Polycarp. 
But Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by apostles in Asia appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna, whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried on the earth a long time, and when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffering martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles and which the church has handed down and which alone are true. This is the case for listening to the apostolic fathers. They learn from the apostles. They know the right answers to all the questions. So, what is it that the apostolic fathers are preaching against? If they know the right answers, and here we are in 180 AD, you have Irenaeus writing that he knew the right answers. Polycarp knew the right answers, and I got them from him. What is it that they're concerned about? What is the disharmonious, incorrect teaching that they're having to work against? Three primary heresies that are good to know about. If you want to dive deeply, deeply into all of these heresies in the early church, we did a whole series on this last year, and it's all on YouTube. Um, it's called A History of Getting It Wrong, and we went into every single heresy. Some of them are exciting. Some of them are boring. They're all heresies. Um, the three that are good to know about for the purpose of discerning what the apostolic fathers are preaching against, docetism, Ebionism, and Marcionism. And very quickly, we'll give you a thumbnail sketch of each of these heresies. Docetism, we talked a little bit about this last week because Ignatius wrote extensively against docetism, named them by name, and said, don't have anything to do with docetists. Docetism comes from the Greek word dokeos, which means to seem Docetism says that Christ was not human, he was a phantom. He only seemed human. He didn't have a real body, he didn't actually suffer, and this is a very Greek idea that divinity can't suffer. So if you're going to sum up Docetism, you would say Jesus is God, or a God, who cannot suffer. And that was Docetism. Now, Docetism would go on and it would grow and morph and it would become combined with other things. And within a hundred or so years after the lives of the apostolic fathers, it would be known as Gnosticism. And the whole mess, Docetism, Gnosticism, and all of these heresies, it's interesting, St. Irenaeus that we're reading about traces the whole problem back to one guy. Five points for any Catholic in the room that knows who the one guy who's credited with starting the Gnostic heresy is. Anybody know? Arius. Hmm? Arius. No, not Arius. That was the Arian heresy, named after him, came a little later. Simon Magus, Simon the Magician, who tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit from the apostles, is credited by the Apostolic Fathers with being the first Gnostic and inventing this heresy and getting the whole ball rolling. And while that sounds at first bl blush like a pious tradition, if you research it a little bit, it's actually pretty well attested to that Simon Magus actually started a religion. That after that ugly scene, when the, uh, he tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit from the, from the apostles, this was after he was baptized, by the way, um, so baptism didn't fix Simon Magus, he fell back into his previous sins again, that he went on to found Gnosticism. He was at least active in it, and he apparently went to Rome. And if you go back and if you get a chance, listen to the class on heresies, you'll find that all of these early heretics, if they wanted to get an airing for their ideas, if they wanted to be popularized, they all went to Rome. They knew where the action was. So docetism, which was early Gnosticism, which said that Jesus was not really human. He only appeared to be. Then you had Ebionism. Now, Ebionism is another of these heresies, and it's changing. You can see the beginnings of it, even in the epistles of St. Paul, where he talks about the Judaizers, people that are coming into Christian communities, and they're teaching a hybrid of Judaism and Christianity. At first, it was just, you need to be circumcised. You need to follow the Jewish dietary laws. And we talked a little bit last week about how this was something the church worked its way through. Some of the Judaizers developed a hybrid religion, and this is all very shrouded in history, exactly which ones we don't know, but Ebionism taught that Christ suffered, 
Therefore, he must not have been God, that he was just a man, that he was a, a, a prophet figure, a leader figure, but nothing divine, nothing, in, nothing any more than human. Now, what's interesting about these two heresies, again, if you get a chance, listen to the heresies class. These two heresies, these are the two ideas that apparently influenced Muhammad the most because you find both of these ideas in the theology of Islam. So if you want to know where Islam gets its ideas about Jesus Christ, it's almost equal parts Gnosticism and Ebionism. And then there's a third heresy in the early church that's worth knowing about, which is Marcionism. And this was started by a guy named Marcion. He'll show up a little later in this presentation. Marcion had a problem that a lot of modern people have. Um, if you go and you troll through the internet, you can find a lot of young people. You can find a lot of people's videos on YouTube where they agonize over this problem. And they say, the God of the Old Testament seems mean. Sometimes he even seems evil to us. Whereas Jesus seems so nice, we don't think they can possibly be the same God. We think it must be different gods. And that was Marcion's idea. So Marcion rejected Judaism, rejected the Old Testament. He had the idea that the God described in the Old Testament was not the real true creator God, not the father of Jesus Christ. He must be something else, something lesser, something failed. So these are three heresies that had legs during this time particularly in the second century in the early church. Docetism, Ebionism, and Marcionism. So keep them in mind because these are the things the early church fathers are teaching against. By the way, Docetism and Ebionism. These heresies were present in the early church during the time when St. John was functioning as an archbishop over these churches of Asia Minor. It's the bishops of these churches of Asia Minor that went to John the Apostle and said, we need apostolic assistance. We need help because these heresies are so tempting to so many Christians. And these preachers of these heresies are so persuasive. We need help against these ideas. The idea that Jesus is God who cannot suffer or that Jesus suffered, therefore he cannot be God. We need this statement. And John obliged and John wrote the Gospel of John. And if you go to the first chapter of the Gospel of John, the preamble to the Gospel of John, that hymn to Christ, read it in light of these two heresies sometime. Read it where it talks about who Jesus is and why Jesus was incarnate. Read that and think about John answering these two heresies. That's what he was doing. And then, you, you remember last week, Ignatius particularly wrote about the docetists, and he says, you can tell a docetist because a docetist doesn't believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That's what Ignatius said. In 108 AD, Ignatius, what a Catholic he was, he said, you can tell a docetist because they don't believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, if John the Apostle is writing his gospel against docetism, then next time you read the Bread of Life discourse or you hear it at Mass where John goes in detail about what Jesus said about his flesh being true food and his blood being true drink, remember, John is saying, I'm an apostle, I know this teaching, and you docetists are wrong. It's an interesting way to look at the Gospel of John as a response to these early heretical ideas. So one incident from Polycarp's life was Polycarp at one point went to Rome. This is a very interesting thing. Catholics will recognize this immediately. So first, Irenaeus writes about the trip. Polycarp it was who, coming to Rome in the time of Anicetus, caused many to turn away from the aforesaid heretics, um, these were the docetists, to the church of God, proclaiming that he had received this one and sole truth from the apostles, that namely, which is handed down by the church. That namely, which is handed down by the church. So Anicetus, he's a saint of the Catholic church. He was the 11th pope after Peter. Popes died in rapid succession. The first several popes were all martyred because if you're in Rome, you're right in the belly of the beast, so to speak, which is exactly what John called Rome in Revelation. And so these popes were dying like flies. So here we are by 155 AD, we're already on the 11th one. In, in 100 years, we've been through 10 popes because they've all been killed. 
Polycarp went to Rome. Now, who is Polycarp? He's the Bishop of Smyrna. And who is right down the road from Smyrna? It's the sea at Ephesus, which is the sea of John the Apostle. But Polycarp has an important matter to discuss. It's the fact that not all Christians are celebrating Easter on the same day. Easter moves around in the Jewish calendar differently than Christians in Rome were reckoning the date of Easter. And so you had Christians in the East, in the province of Asia, were celebrating Easter about a week off from the Christians in Rome and in the West celebrating it. This is called the Quarto de Simeon controversy. And if you like math, you can go read about that, about how Easter was dated. It was a problem, and people were getting their feathers ruffled over it all over. And so Polycarp, who's the Bishop of Smyrna, does he go to Ephesus? Does he go to the Sea of the Apostle John to go and work this problem out? Nope. He goes to Rome. Why? Because that's the Sea of Peter, because he has to go see the Pope. So here we are in 155 AD, and we have excellent records of a bishop from Asia traveling all the way to Rome because he has an issue that concerns the whole church, and he has to go see the Pope. 155 AD. Again, remember last week we talked about how the basic Protestant idea about Catholicism is that it was invented in the fourth century or thereabouts. Like I talked about last week, that's what I was taught as a kid in the Baptist church, is that Catholicism was invented in the fourth century. Bzz, no, bishops are going to Rome to talk to the Pope in the second century. And they're going to the See of Peter not the see of any of the other apostles. So, this is great. While in Rome, Polycarp met Marcion, who was the author of Marcionism, which was one of the great heresies in the early church. Was Polycarp all lovey-dovey about him? Was Polycarp magnanimous? No. Marcion is reported to have asked Polycarp, do you know me? Do you know who I am? Marcion had gone to Rome because his ideas were so important. He had to take him to Rome, the center of the church. And Polycarp is reported to have replied, I do know you, the firstborn of Satan. So this was Polycarp's opinion about heresy and heretics. He had nothing to do with them, wanted nothing to do with them. By the way, if you get into reading the early church fathers, you can read accounts of how St. John treated heretics. It's essentially the same way. And so when the apostles taught their students how should you feel about heresy, they taught them to be virulently opposed, militantly opposed to heresy. It was not all lovey-dovey in the early church. Heresy was not tolerated. Okay, so we have one letter written by Polycarp. It's written to the Philippians. It's essentially a cover letter for the collection of the epistles of Ignatius. Okay, so it's written in the decade after Ignatius is killed. So Polycarp is one of the, one of the letters of Ignatius is addressed to him. He's one of the recipients of an original letter. And apparently the church there at Smyrna had some or all of the epistles of Ignatius. And of course, people are going to ask for them. For the next century or so after this, people even pass around the idea that these letters of Ignatius might be considered to be holy scripture. Now, the church eventually rejects this idea because only apostolic texts written by the apostles or by people who were scribes for the apostles are going to make it as scripture. Ignatius's letters are not scripture. We obviously don't read them at Master in the Liturgy of the Word. But for a century or so, after Ignatius wrote them, people in the churches tended to use them in that way. So people are asking, can we get a copy of these things? Do you have a copy? And Polycarp possesses copies of some of these letters. So when he sends the collection to Philippi, he writes a cover letter to go with it. And we have that cover letter. And what's interesting is he's writing this now, 110 to 120 AD, and it quotes nearly the entire New Testament. It's very interesting to see that at this point in time, here we are, 110 AD, Polycarp as bishop, either he has, or some have said he's memorized virtually all of the New Testament because he quotes it freely in this letter and to great effect. If you get a chance to read the entire letter, that one's short, 15 minutes, you're done with it. It's on New Advent. <laughs>
It also, and I think this is something Catholics will enjoy knowing, it quotes the book of Tobit. Why is that important? Because the book of Tobit is in Catholic Bibles, and the book of Tobit is largely rejected from non-Catholic Protestant Bibles. Just a word real quickly on this issue of the canon of Scripture. These disputed books were never disputed until the time of Martin Luther, until the early 16th century. These are books, you know, the Catholic canon of Scripture is larger. It includes several books in the Old Testament that modern Protestants either outright don't use or tiptoe around, try to avoid, try to diminish. And there are some very, very Catholic principles in them, um, praying for the dead praying you know, for souls in purgatory being a primary reason why these books are uncomfortable for non-Catholics to use. But here we have Polycarp writing in 110 to 120, and he quotes from the book of Tobit alongside other books of Scripture, meaning is he using the expanded, is he using the larger Old Testament like Catholics? Yes. This is not a change Catholics made. This is something we've done all the way along. So, We'll now take some quotations from the letter of St. Polycarp. And I wish we had more letters from St. Polycarp, but we only have the one, but it's a good one. So, salvation. If we were to teleport ourselves into one of the non-Catholic churches in Tyler, Texas, on any typical Sunday, and we listen to a sermon, we would likely hear about salvation by faith alone. We would likely hear doctrines which said that if you give your heart to Jesus or you say the sinner's prayer or, well, I was taught, if you accept Christ as your personal Savior, you will be one time and for all time irrevocably saved and destined for heaven. And there's no way that you can lose this or wipe this out. Is this the original apostolic understanding of salvation? Well, but he who raised him up from the dead will raise up us also if we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false witness, not rendering evil for evil, but being mindful of what the Lord said in his teachings. Judge not. There are many, many conditions placed upon this by Polycarp, who learned this doctrine of salvation from who? St. John. John learned it from Christ, from the horse's mouth, Salvation is not once for all and irrevocable. Now, what Catholics believe about salvation is often parodied and lampooned by non-Catholics as being salvation by works. You've heard that. I'm sure you've been accused of that once or twice. We don't believe in salvation by works. We believe in salvation as a free gift of grace, which we can reject. And we can reject it by immorality or by heresy. Polycarp is teaching a thoroughly Catholic doctrine on salvation when? 110 to 120 AD. Polycarp on the priesthood. And let the priest be compassionate and merciful to all, bringing back those that wander. We'll stop there for a second. The priests are being compassionate and merciful, bringing back those that wander. What does it mean to wander? To wander from Christianity would be in immorality or heresy. To sin either by an action or by professing a false doctrine. And so priests are to do what? To bring them back. We already know from last week from Ignatius that they're to bring them back by the sacrament of penance. And so here Polycarp is telling priests to do what? Be compassionate and merciful in the sacrament of penance to bring back those that wander to visit all the sick and not neglecting the widow, the orphan, or the poor. This is a pretty good explanation of the merciful duties of the priesthood right here. To exercise the sacrament of penance in a merciful way, to go to the sick and to the poor. And what we talked about last week, um, all of these apostolic fathers are teaching a thoroughly Catholic hierarchy of deacon, priest, and bishop in all of their letters. The deacons who serve, the priests who administer under the bishops, and the bishops who are the overseers over the towns. Oh, and also we talked about last week, if you remember, that the word that 
when we translate these ancient Greek documents, that it's a dodge. It's not good practice to leave one word in a sentence untranslated. And if you read some of these translations of ancient Greek documents, you can see that word in there, presbyter. If somebody's uncomfortable with the idea of the priesthood, a lot of times they'll leave that word untranslated or they'll translate it into Latin. So you have the word presbyteros. And if you translate it into, if that's Greek, if you translate it into Latin, it's presbyter. If you translate it into English, it's priest. So now, if you're going to translate this sentence from the letter of Polycarp into English, so what should you translate presbyteros as? Well, if you're going to go to English, it's priest. If you see it translated as presbyter, that's a dodge. That's somebody that for some reason was uncomfortable with translating the word to priest. We as Catholics know there have always been three classes of clerics, three classes of ordained men, deacons, priests, and bishops. It's always been this way. There's something in between deacons and bishops. That word, uh, we have the word priest. It comes to us from German. If you translate presbyteros into Latin, it's presbyter into German, priesta. Into English from German, priest. It's all the same word. And there have always been priests in between who? Deacons and bishops. Polycarp on the works of charity. When you can do good, defer it not, because alms delivers from death. I really like this one. There's no way to make this sound Protestant, no matter how hard you try, because this is that works are part of faith. This is what's taught in the epistle of James in Scripture. This is what Christ teaches at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, talking about the great judgment. What is the believer going to be asked at the judgment, did you clothe the naked? Did you, visit the, did you visit the sick? Did you visit the imprisoned? Did you feed the hungry? Did you do these things which are indicative of the gift of faith within you? And so Polycarp just comes right out and says it. Alms, alms is a voluntary work done for someone less fortunate. Alms, doing work for the less fortunate, delivers from death. Polycarp's very blunt about this. So Polycarp, at the end of his life, suffered martyrdom, as Irenaeus said. Now, there's, a, there's an extant document called the Martyrdom of Polycarp, and it's highly disputed um, how reliable it is. So I'm not going to quote from it extensively, but it was apparently written pretty close to this actual event, and people get upset about it because Polycarp comes off as a real serious hero in there, but... I don't see any reason to disbelieve that a bishop who learned the faith from John wouldn't be heroic at his martyrdom. So I don't have any particular problem with the martyrdom of Polycarp. Um, there's a lot of, if you go and read the martyrdom of Polycarp, it has the dialogue between Polycarp and the Roman proconsul who interrogated him. And it's, it's great back and forth. I only want to talk about one thing that he said is... Um, the Roman proconsul said, all you have to do to live, just deny Jesus Christ. And uh, Poly Polycarp responded, 86 years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme the king who has saved me? 86 years I've served him. How old was Polycarp at his martyrdom? 86. So he served Jesus how long? His entire life, since he was an infant. From which, I think we can see that Polycarp was probably baptized as a child because the early church fathers, entrance into the church is only through baptism. We as Catholics, we keep this doctrine, unlike a lot of our non-Catholic friends and neighbors, even in the city of Tyler, that don't believe in baptism, and certainly not an infant baptism. We baptize infants like Polycarp was apparently baptized as an infant. Polycarp was sentenced to be burned alive. The martyrdom of Polycarp says that he wouldn't burn. He was there in the midst of the flames. He wouldn't burn. So the proconsul ordered one of the centurions to go stab him, and he was stabbed, and he bled out, and he died there. It's interesting. So from the martyrdom of Polycarp, chapter 18, this is the earliest reference in the history of the church to um, the collection and veneration of relics. Uh, the centurion then, seeing the strife excited by the Jews, because the Jewish citizens there in Asia Minor apparently were no friends with Polycarp, and they, de they did def definitely want to see the Catholics, um, well, they wanted to see the bishop killed anyway. Uh, remember, this is a time when there's still a lot of strife between Orthodox Jews and early Christians. There's a lot of problems there. 
the centurion placed the body in the midst of the fire and consumed it. Accordingly, we afterwards took up his bones as being more precious than the most exquisite jewels and more purified than gold and deposited them in a fitting place, whither being gathered together as opportunities allowed us with joy and rejoicing, the Lord shall grant us to celebrate the anniversary of his martyrdom, both in memory of those who have already finished their course and for the exercising and preparation of those yet to walk in their steps. What do we have here? This is a second century document about the martyrdom of a Catholic saint, and you have the faithful collecting the first class relics of St. Polycarp, interring them in a reliquary, and keeping the feast day of the martyrdom every year. How long have we been doing this as Catholics? Since about the middle of the second century. So, Polycarp has died, and we only have one epistle from Polycarp. This gives us an opportunity now to show how Polycarp transmitted his information on to the next generation. St. Irenaeus is a student of Polycarp. He writes a lot about Polycarp, and now we can talk about what St. Irenaeus taught, what he said about the apostolic teaching. St. Irenaeus is a crusader for orthodoxy. All the zeal that Polycarp had to keep the actual faith against heretics, Irenaeus had just as much zeal. Um, on the necessity of avoiding heresy and also on how a Christian may be certain of orthodox teaching. This was Irenaeus' particular interest in his writings, is how can you be certain that you're getting the truth? He wrote against heresies in 180 AD, and this is a very detailed refutation of Gnosticism. At this point in 180 AD, the Gnostic heresy is flourishing. It's getting more and more and more complicated and built up. There are accretions sticking to it, all kinds of cosmologies. It's developing a life of its own. It's still around today. There are still Gnostics in the world. Um, and there was a very definite story that the Gnostics were telling, and we'll get into that. It's fascinating. Um, he also wrote a book called The Proof of the Apostolic Teaching, which was written after Against Heresies, and it's a very basic catechism. It's apparently intended for people that are interested in converting or that have recently converted, and it's basically a narrative of the Christian story. It makes for interesting reading. Um, if you've ever heard the phrase, Seventh Heaven, um, that comes from the teaching of St. Irenaeus. St. Irenaeus has a very detailed understanding of heaven, and he actually enumerates it as having seven parts, and we don't have much other information about that. But that's where the phrase seventh heaven comes from, is from the writings of Irenaeus. So if you read Irenaeus, you can read Proof of the Apostolic Teaching. That takes about 30 minutes to read. And like I said, if you want to dig in, have a week, if you've got a week of evenings to spend on it, read Against Heresies. It really is fascinating. So... This is great. St. Irenaeus writing about heresies and about how to figure out whether you have the right teaching. We are in a position to reckon up those who were by the apostles instituted bishops in the churches and to demonstrate the succession of these men to our own times, those who neither taught nor knew anything like what these heretics rave about. For if the apostles had known hidden mysteries which they were in the habit of imparting to the perfect apart and privily from the rest, they would have delivered them especially to those whom they were also committing, the churches themselves. This is St. Irenaeus' basic argument for being a Catholic and against being a heretic. He's saying these heretics are running around saying they have some other knowledge. They have some other religion. And when I tell you what the Gnostics were saying back then, you'll probably recognize it, particularly if you have the History Channel in your house. The Gnostics were running around, one Valentinus in Rome being one of the head Gnostics, they were running around saying, well, all of you Catholics, you know, you're following the teaching of Paul and of Peter and of John, but that's not really the, the real Christianity. Jesus actually told Thomas more stuff. And we have this more stuff that Jesus told Thomas. And if you have National Geographic Channel or the History Channel or the Discovery Channel in your house, every year around Easter you start having programs about the Gospel of Thomas. Did Jesus say something else to Thomas? Can we actually find out 
what the actual information, and it's the same old stuff that Irenaeus had the perfect answer to in 180 AD. We've still got it. Dan Brown, who wrote The Da Vinci Code, this is a big part of what his fiction books are based on, is the idea that there's secret things that not all the apostles know about. And Irenaeus says, look, if there was some secret stuff that the apostles had, said they would pass it on to the bishops, not to these crazy people. The bishops know, if there's, if there's inside guys, if there's guys that know the inside baseball of all this, it's the bishops. They're the important ones. They're the ones that are ha being handed on all the secret stuff. And it's not secret. It's what we have in the church. And so Irenaeus says, these crazy people that are raving about this, they're saying that they have a connection that they demonstrably don't have, and we do. It was an argument that made perfect sense then. It makes perfect sense now. And of course, if you watch the History Channel and various things, you know at the end of the program you find out that it's all a house of cards because there's no first or second or third century documentation for anything that they say. All they have is 500 years after this. You have people in Egypt and they're writing Gnostic things down and they still don't have any apostolic connection. So it's a very prescient thing that Irenaeus was doing. Irenaeus writes, this is, should be also be very interesting to a modern Catholic. Irenaeus, who knew Polycarp, who knew the apostles, this is horse's mouth here, writes about the origin of the Gospels. Matthew also is, issued a written Gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. And boy, this is controversial because we don't have a copy of the Gospel of Matthew in either Hebrew or Aramaic, which is what, if you, if you read the... Uh, uh, what Irenaeus is writing here, he's not saying that it was written in Hebrew, he's saying it's written in the language of the Hebrews, which at the time, the Hebrews used two languages. One, the lingua franca was Aramaic, but the language of liturgy was Hebrew. And so Irenaeus is saying the Gospel of Matthew was written in either Aramaic or Hebrew. And so we don't have a copy, we only have a copy in, in Greek. And so biblical scholarship says, oh, we don't know about this. And this is a, always a controversial topic here. But there are some biblical scholars that think that if you go through some parts of the Gospel of Matthew, it actually is in a poetic meter. It actually rhymes in Hebrew. And in Greek, it doesn't. All that's lost in Greek. So if you want to read interesting things, you can read about whether we're eventually going to decide that Irenaeus was completely right. I think he was. Because, you know, he, was, he knew these people, he had a much closer chain than we do. And so probably Matthew was written in Hebrew or Aramaic. I think, it's a, I think it probably is true. Well, Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome. Now that would have been in the early 60s AD. So he's dating the Gospel of Matthew for us to the late 50s or early 60s AD. And laying the foundations of the church in Rome. After their departure... Well, they died is how they departed. Peter and Paul died in Rome. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter. This is all kinds of information. Mark was the disciple of Peter. We know that. But why would he have been the interpreter of Peter? Peter is, we know of Peter as being the big, strong, kind of ignorant fisherman, right? Peter was probably illiterate, and he may not have spoken Latin. And so if he was in Rome, the people would, the lingua franca there would have been Latin. Peter would have spoken Aramaic. He would have learned some Hebrew when he was um, in Hebrew school. And he may have known some Greek because Greek was spoken all over the, the Middle East. But he may not have known enough Latin to get by. So if Mark is the interpreter of Peter, he's probably the Latin interpreter of Peter. And Mark did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke, also the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. We've got a tremendous amount of information here about how the gospels came to be, the languages they were composed in, the relationship of the authors to the apostles, and it's all here, 180 A.D., 180 A.D. This is not later inventions. This is very, very early. We know this. I find this fascinating. So, now, I like this one a lot. 
So we, are, we see already that Irenaeus says that if you want to know you're getting the actual teaching, you should you know, know that your bishop is in a succession of men from the apostles. And if you know your town, you know your town, like if you're in Antioch, you know that Peter founded the church at Antioch, and you know that Ignatius was the second bishop after Peter, and you know the succession of bishops. However, there are a lot of such Episcopal sees, a lot of cities in the world, where the apostles planted churches and named bishops. So Irenaeus says, it would be very tedious in such a volume as this, this is his book he's writing, to reckon up all the successions of all the churches. Well, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of bishops. There were a lot of places. The pedigree of all of these bishops would take up an entire book on its own. By indicating that tradition derived from the apostles of the very great, the very ancient, and universally known church founded and organized at Rome, you don't have to know the pedigree of all of the individual churches in the world you only have to know the one at Rome. Why? For it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church in Rome on account of its preeminent authority. If you know who the Pope is, you know where to find Orthodox Catholic teaching. Even if you don't live in a town, even if you don't know your bishop, even if you don't know the pedigree of your bishop, if some heretic comes and teaches something to you and you don't know if it's right or not, you only have to know what does Rome say? 180 AD, extremely early in the history of the church and written by a man who was taught the faith by bishops who knew the apostles. And he says, for it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church, the church in Rome, on account of its preeminent authority. Is the papacy a later invention? No, it's not. It's apostolic. Remember last week we talked about, well, if this is so obvious, how could the Protestant reformers operate in an environment like this? The Protestant reformers largely didn't know about the Apostolic Fathers. This, some of these things are matters of later archaeology. Some of them were in dispute at that point in time. There were a variety of reasons, or in, like in the case of John Calvin, they simply just didn't believe it. And of course, modern Protestant scholars, sometimes very uncomfortably, they have to accept that these are genuine documents. All of the research indicates these are genuine and they've been part of the treasures of the church since the beginning. So you either have to be ignorant of these or you have to reject them irrationally, I think, in order not to see that they compel someone to see the Catholic view of things. This one, tie a Protestant in knots. This is Irenaeus in 180 AD. So now, we as Catholics, if you operate in the world and if you talk to non-Catholic Christians about your faith, eventually the place of Mary in the economy of salvation is going to come up and you're probably, most of us, are going to stumble over that one. It's going to be difficult for us because we know that with the exception of Revelation chapter 12, I believe it is, there's not a lot of Mariology in the New Testament. We know that. And we know that we're inferring a lot of our Marian theology. It's not explicit in the New Testament. But boy, is it explicit in the early church fathers. This is, again, Irenaeus. To sum up, this is a long paragraph about Mary as the new Eve. But it sums up in the end. Um, and thus also it was that the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. For what the virgin Eve had bound fast through unbelief this did the Virgin Mary set free through faith. We Catholics place a tremendous amount of importance on Mary's fiat. When Mary agreed, the famous statement, let it be, that she told the angel, we place a lot of importance on this event, that this is a salvific event in human history. Without Mary's fiat, you don't have the incarnation. Without the incarnation, you don't have salvation. We understand that Mary is integral to this process of salvation. Is this a modern Catholic invention? No. This is 180 AD, and it's written by a guy who got the faith second generation from the apostles, particularly from John. And as any Catholic knows, 
John was the caretaker for Mary at the end of her life. John knew Mary very, very well. And so this is Irenaeus, who was taught by Polycarp, who was taught by John. John, who was the caretaker for Mary, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother from the cross. This is from the horse's mouth. These people knew this theology. This theology is not invented along the way. Like I said last week, this is why I'm Catholic. This is what compelled me to be Catholic. And again, and if the former did disobey God, yet the latter was persuaded to be obedient to God in order that the Virgin Mary might become the patroness. Um, the word is uh, advocate. It's the feminine form of advocate, advocata. Um, that the Virgin Mary might become the patroness or advocate of the Virgin Eve. And thus, as the human race fell into bondage to death by means of a virgin, so it is rescued by a virgin. Virginal disobedience having been balanced in the opposite scale by virginal obedience. This is an extremely Marian view of salvation. Now, if you hop down the road to a Baptist church or a Church of Christ, you'll find you'll get a tremendous amount of agreement as, of Christ as the new Adam. This is Pauline theology, everybody knows it, that Christ is obedient to the Father in the place where Adam, the first man, was disobedient to the Father, and that this is the res restoration of grace. But when you connect Mary to this, that Mary was, an imp was a necessary player in this, that's, well, we Catholics have thought this all along. This is not something that we realize somewhere along the way. That makes sense to everybody? It, it should, I think, if you haven't ever seen this before, if you've never seen this Mariology in the early church fathers, I think that it can, um, it can really strengthen the foundation of your own understanding of Mariology and your own Marian devotion to know that it's this old and completely authentic. There's no, there's no reason to ever have any squeamishness for a Catholic to ever have squeamishness about the devotion that we have to Mary and her integral part to the economy of salvation, because it's right here in the Fathers. On the question of whether obedience is required for salvation, we've already seen this from Polycarp, but it's even more explicit in Irenaeus, is obedience required for salvation, or is salvation something that you get for faith alone? They, the Jews, had therefore a law, a course of discipline, and a prophecy of future things, for God at the first indeed warning them by means of natural precepts, which from the beginning he had implanted in mankind. That's the natural law written in men's hearts. It's a Pauline, part of Pauline theology. That is by means of the Decalogue. The Decalogue is the Ten Commandments, which if anyone does not observe, he has no salvation, did then demand nothing more of them. So here we have a treatise on how God gave his law to the Jews. And in the middle of this, when he talks about the Ten Commandments, then Irenaeus says about the Ten Commandments, if anyone does not observe them, he has no salvation. Anyone, not just Jews, not just, but anyone doesn't observe them. He has no salvation. This is a basic Catholic teaching. What are our examinations of conscience that we use before the sacrament of reconciliation based on? Even the one I've got on my iPhone, the I Confess app, is based on the Ten Commandments. Why is it based on the Ten Commandments? Because they are the perpetual guide for morality, not just a Jewish guide for morality, that Christians also must follow the Ten Commandments. If you break the commandments, you're committing a serious sin, which you then must confess. If anyone does not observe the Decalogue, he has no salvation. This comes from when? the apostolic times. We're going to see that even more explicitly next week when we talk about the, the didache. Again, this is from Against Heresies, written by St. Irenaeus, 180 AD. And of course, Irenaeus confirms, just like Ignatius did last week, for as the bread which is produced from the earth when it receives the invocation of God is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist, consisting of two realities, earthly and heavenly, consisting of two realities. So sometimes if you talk to a non-Catholic person about our Catholic beliefs and you bring up the Eucharist, the non-Catholic person will be very upset because they'll say, well, I don't believe in transubstantiation. 
Transubstantiation is something that was made up in medieval times. The idea that it changes, but that there's accidents and substance and that the appearance is... No. Two realities, earthly and heavenly. This is completely consistent with the later formulations, the later words that were chosen by the church, like transubstantiation, substance and accidents, these technical terms. But the idea is here in Irenaeus. And by the way, this is another thing. If you ever get a chance to read um, Cardinal John Henry Newman, um, Cardinal John Henry Newman wrote a book which is very difficult reading because it was written in the 19th century and the language sounds very flowery and Victorian to us now. But it's on the development of Christian doctrine. If you ever read it, John Henry Newman, awesome, awesome guy. He's a blessed now. So he was a, a priest of the Anglican Church who converted to the Roman Catholic Church and became a cardinal. And what converted him was he researched the early church fathers and he wrote a book about how all the teachings of the modern Catholic Church are present in simplified form, in less technically described form, but all the teachings are present at the very beginning of the church. And this is one of the things that he pointed out is that the modern teaching of the church, this very technically expressed teaching about the Eucharist, that the process by which the Eucharist becomes the body and blood of Christ is rightly called transubstantiation. The Council of Trent said this is the right word we're going to use for it. And it means that the substance of the bread and the wine is changed, but that the appearances remain. John Henry Newman, looking at this, said, well, yeah, I can see this teaching all the way back in the early church fathers. They didn't have the technical language, but they had the idea. And when Newman had gone through every single teaching of the church, he said, for every single teaching, like our teaching on Mariology, he said, yeah, some of these technical terms like latria and dulia and these things are not present, but the ideas are all apostolic. And at the end of this great work that he had done, he summed it up. I love the way Newman summed up what he had found out about this. He said, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. And he did cease to be Protestant and became Catholic and became a great cardinal of the church. So if you ever get a chance to read about John Henry Newman or if you want to do some real heavy lifting, read the book by John Henry Newman. He actually wrote two. Um, one is uh, Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which is an explanation for my life. And that's also heavy lifting but really good. And then On the Development of Doctrine is fan fantastic. Okay. So next week, we're going to finish up next week with the third session. We're going to talk about Pope St. Clement I, and we're going to talk about the Didache. Pope St. Clement I is one of the successors of St. Peter, the Pope in Rome, and we're going to talk about how he exercised his authority, which is absolutely fascinating. Anybody that thinks that the papacy is some late invention, we've been hammering that away. And next week, we're going to get out the big hammer of St. Clement. We're going to drive that completely away. And we're also going to talk about the Didache. The Dake is the first catechism of the Catholic Church, and it's absolutely fascinating. So I'm looking forward to this. We'll do this next week. Now, between now and then, we've got a very special event occurring in the cathedral parish. This weekend, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., we have a priestly ordination. You probably have seen we've had a transitional deacon around the parish. That's Matthew Staling, um, who has been formed. He was formed uh, here in the States for a while, and then he went to Rome and studied Christology in Rome. Um, and maybe you were uh, watching TV uh, last year in the middle of the night at the Epiphany, uh, where he chanted the gospel at the Pope's uh, Epiphany Mass. Um, so this is someone who's been in the heart of the church, learned all of these things from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and then has come back. He's been serving at the cathedral here as a deacon for a year. He's going to be ordained a priest on Saturday. Now, if you want to act real Catholic, come to this ordination on Saturday. It's going to last a couple, three hours. Deal with it. And then you want to act real, real Catholic, after the ordination, come over to the gym and receive a first blessing. And if you want some good stories about first blessings, come talk to me. I'll convince you to do it and come get a first blessing because first blessings are awesome. Anyway. <laughs>
So if you want to go and you want to see the ordination of someone who has been in the heart of the church, being formed from the heart of the church in Rome, and is now coming back out to us, out here in the hinterlands, to bring this apostolic teaching to us, and it now is going to be ordained a priest, come on Saturday. It's going to be awesome. Now, you may also know he started a choir while he was here. He started a scola, which is a traditional choir that chants the Gregorian chants in Latin and English. And so he's been working with those people, and I think they're going to be chanting at his ordination. So it's going to be really pretty. That's 10 a.m. at Chapel of Peter and Paul. So uh, try to come to it if you, if you can. It'll be awesome. Okay, Till next week. Thanks.